Hello and good evening. My name is Dr. Brian Henning and I am Professor of Philosophy and Chair of the Environmental Studies Department here at Gonzaga University. I'm happy to be the moderator of this evening's event, the second annual Spokane Candidates Climate Change Forum. I would like to begin first with a land acknowledgement. As you see on the slide, we all have a place where each of us has historically come from. This place is this ancestral homeland of the people of the Spokane tribe. It's important that we begin by reflecting on this for a moment. To welcome you to our event this evening, it's my great pleasure to invite Dr. Dina Gonzalez, Senior Vice, Pre Senior Vice President and Provost of Gonzaga University. Dr. Gonzalez, thank you so much for joining us. I wanna thank you, Professor Henning, for inviting me and for having um this forum and and this opportunity to meet with candidates from county commission districts from congressional districts from legislative uh, districts it is important too to thank our sponsors as well as our organizers i know many of you have been involved in this event and it is wonderful to see the work of students um, and from the department of environmental studies in particular at gonzaga university to participate in this on behalf of the university I want to say that we are so pleased that you have taken this opportunity to share your thoughts with us. As a Jesuit Catholic humanistic university, we sometimes are asked why climate change? And we always respond by saying that this speaks, of course, to one of our uh, missions, to the notion of care and of purpose, embodied perhaps most strongly of all by Pope Francis in his many speeches and homilies and encyclicals to all pointing us in the direction of caring and of becoming familiar, becoming environmentally literate, so to speak. This is one skill we impart to our students and we are extremely pleased that the Department of Environmental Studies and the many partners across the campus are similarly engaged. We look forward to the opportunity to hear your thoughts and to respond to the questions on the climate and particularly climate change in our current era. Um, and we, again, thank you for being with us and thank you to the sponsors and organizers one more time for helping us to pull all of you together. We appreciate very much your, um, your participation and also your interest in this topic. So welcome and thank you. Thank you so much, Provost Gonzalez. And thank all of you at home for joining us for this second annual event. This event this evening, as Dr. Gonzalez mentioned, is made possible by a number of different organizations in Spokane. Uh, it's hosted, as you know, by the Environmental Studies Department here at Gonzaga. It's also co-sponsored by a number of our important environmental organizations here in Spokane, including 350 Spokane, the Lands Council, Spokane Riverkeeper, FutureWise, the Community Building, and Sunrise Spokane. You can find out more about these wonderful community organizations by visiting them online. In the chat, you'll find links to their websites and I encourage you to get involved with those wonderful organizations. Please note that this event is being recorded and it will be available tomorrow online afternoon at our website. Again, you can find that link in the chat. The Spokane Candidates Climate Change Forum was created in 2019 out of the belief that democracy only works if citizens are aware of candidates' views on our most pressing issues and if they vote. We believe that climate change is an issue of vital importance to our community and to the world. Contrary to how it is commonly presented, climate change is not primarily a partisan issue. According to a study by the Yale Center for Climate Communication, 73% of Americans describe themselves as either cautious, concerned, or alarmed about global warming, whereas only 20% of Americans are either doubtful or dismissive. Most citizens in Spokane are interested in candidates' views on global warming and what they would do to help Spokane mitigate its causes and adapt to its effects. If you attended this event last year, you might recall that we facilitated respectful discussion by having uh, the attendees have red and green cards. This platform unfortunately doesn't make that possible. We'll also not be using the Q&A or the chat features except for the panelists and the, the moderators to communicate with you. Instead, if you'd like to provide real-time reactions to candidate statements, we encourage you to go to our Facebook page where you can use that platform's tools to comment and react. In the chat, you can find a link to our Facebook page where you can comment there. 
the climate forum tonight will follow the, the format used for presidential debates. Though, of course, we hope candidates don't follow that example. Candidates will each have two minutes to respond to a question, and there will be up to an additional one minute for the moderator to facilitate further discussion. When a candidate has 20 seconds left, Trenton uh, Miller from 350 Spokane, if Trenton could turn on his video, will hold up a yellow square. And when your time is up, that's for 20 seconds. And when your time is up, he'll hold up a red square. So hopefully that'll give you a, a sense as to how you're doing on time. With your help, we can make sure that everybody has equal time to share their views with Spokane citizens. The forum this evening is divided into three segments, starting with county races, and then races for the Washington State Legislature, and finally the federal race for the 5th Congressional District. In this first segment, we'll focus on the races for Spokane County Commissioner. As you know, Spokane County is divided into three dis different districts. In case you're not familiar with exactly how those are divided, just to give you an overview, Spokane City is in the middle here. So to zoom in a little bit, District 1 is in the northeast to the Idaho border. District 2 is in the southeast. So again, the core of Spokane downtown is here. And District 3 is here. So that gives you a sense as to uh, how our county uh, districts are divided for now. Spokane County uh, Districts 1 and 2 are on the ballot this year. Voters in District 1 in the northeast of the county will choose between Ted Cummings and Josh Kearns, while voters in District 2 in the southeast of the county will choose between David Green and Mary Cooney. After the top two primaries, we invited all of these finalists to attend this forum this evening. Regrettably, neither Josh Kearns nor Mary Cooney were uh, accepted our invitation to attend. However, we are very happy to have with us two candidates for Spokane County Commissioner, Mr. Ted Cummings, who is running for District 1, and David Green, who is running for County Commissioner in District 2. And I invite Mr. Cummings and Mr. Green to turn on their microphone and their video now. So again, I will pose questions to the candidates who will then each have two minutes to respond. And at my discretion, there'll be up to a minute for additional facilitation. Trenton will hold up the yellow and the red. And if you speak too long, long uh, then, you know, uh, which I don't think will happen <laughs> if, if necessary, uh, we can mute in order to be able to make sure everybody has equal time. So, okay, so let's begin. The first question goes to you, Mr. Cummings. Mr. Cummings, what, if any, are your concerns about global warming's effects on Spokane County, the inland Northwest, and the world? That question is in the chat as well, if you want to see it there. Mr. Cummings, you have two minutes. Uh well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, inviting me here tonight. Uh, it, it's a wonderful uh, event that you have, and I'm, I'm happy to be part of it. Um, I work at Kaiser Aluminum, so obviously uh, I, I know a little bit about uh, industry and climate change. And uh, I think that's one of my primary concerns is, is the just, just transition uh, of achieving that and going green. Obviously, uh, we don't have a choice. We're going to have to find ways to manufacture and to live and, and to work uh, greener than we are now, or we're not going to have a, a planet. So um, we're, we're acutely aware of that at, at Kaiser and uh, the steel workers work with many uh, environmental groups to uh, reduce our carbon footprint. So we're working on things like uh, uh, zero discharge in, in the water. Um, we, we use uh, uh, high efficient uh, burners in, on our furnaces. And we like to think that we are the cleanest, most efficient uh, kind of facility in the world. And that's, that's what our goal is. So we're continually looking at innovation and um, continuous improvement to make that uh, our process cleaner and greener and, and look for alternatives in every aspect of, of what we do. And I think that's the philosophy we need to take everywhere. We need to, um, and we can use this now, we have a, a housing shortage here. So I think we need to, to look at how we plan for the future. What, what are materials are we gonna use to build these homes and how are we gonna site them and, and the transportation so that those people can get to and from their job, uh, jobs and shopping. So I, I think, uh, it's a huge challenge, but I think uh, working collaboratively, we can uh, be up to the task and, and be a leader, not only in, in our state and country, but the world. Just a quick follow-up, Mr. Cummings, in terms of concerns about global warming's effects on Spokane County, do you have any concerns specifically about the effects of, of global warming on our county? 
Sure, I, I, I think the fires every year are a constant reminder of uh, we're getting drier um, and, and the, the health aspects of it, the loss of natural habitat. And um, it, it's, it's shocking and it's dismaying that, you know, uh, not everybody's on board yet. And I hope we don't wait until uh, things get worse. I think we need to be proactive and get out there, protect our river, protect our air and, uh, and our land. Thank you so much, Mr. Cummings. Mr. Green, the same question to you. What, if any, are your concerns about global warming's effects on Spokane County, the Inland Northwest, and the world? Thank you, Dr. Henning. And I'd like to start off by just noting that this is presumably the last election where uh, the two commissioners that represent District 1 and District 2 will actually be voted on countywide. Um, we moved to election by districts in 2022 under a recent Supreme Court decision and bipartisan state law, but that um, everyone in the county will be able to vote on the candidates for District 1 and District 2. And I got involved um, in climate relatively recently. Um, I'm a, in my role as vice chair of the state Democratic Party, I'm an automatic member of the Democratic National Committee. And in August of 2019, I voted to create, um, voted along with many, many, many other members of the DNC, voted to create the uh, Bayer Council on the Environment and Climate Crisis. And later on at that same meeting, I was elected vice chair of that council. So I have been working with um, other leaders in, in my party on uh, creating policy recommendations for uh, our party's platform. And um, that takes it from sort of the global and national level on down locally. I'm a member of the Lands Council. Um, I do think that the county um, has a lot of low hanging fruit to grasp with respect to climate policy. Um, and sustainability issues. If you go to spokanecounty.org and put in two words in the search box, climate change, you'll see hardly anything pop up. If you put in the word sustainability, you'll see hardly anything pop up. And then if you go to my.spokanecity.org and put in those same two words, climate change and sustainability, you'll see that the city has done much, much more than the county has. So I think there's a great opportunity um, to address issues locally, uh, to focus on uh, matters relating to our air, as, as Ted mentioned, certainly our water, which is huge here in Spokane County, as well as land and food policy, because those not only impact the environment, but they also impact public health and mental health. Thank you so much, Mr. Green. I'd like to move on to our second question, which would focus on transportation. And I'll throw this first to you, to Mr. Green. Uh, as you might know, tailpipe emissions are the number one source of greenhouse gas emissions in the state of Washington. So I have a two-part question for you. Uh, first, what is your understanding of the links between land use, transportation, and climate change? And secondly, what policies do you support to help Spokane County residents reduce individual vehicle miles traveled? Thanks. The, the, the links are, um, are incredibly interwoven uh, amongst each other. Unfortunately, um, the regulation or things that we can actively change. We, we can't regulate um, uh, emissions here in Spokane County. Washington State does. Um, California is obviously the leader in that area. Uh, but we can't, what we can do is create um, a council on, uh, maybe it's an in environmental infrastructure work group for the county, which would create an energy and environmental infrastructure policy that could help us focus on a, a, environmental policies, it could help us focus on environmental justice um, and help the county. The county is, I think, the fourth largest employer in Spokane County um, and has you know, a couple thousand people working for it. And, and there's a lot that we can do as an employer, but also as a, in helping to set some policies um, with respect to trying to achieve the Paris Accords net zero goals. Um, and we um, also, the commissioners sit on a number of boards, including the Spokane Transportation Authority or Transit Authority, Transit Authority. And so I think there's opportunities there for commissioners to take a lead in working with other elected officials on, on local policies. Thank you, Mr. Green. Do you have any specific transportation policies that you would advocate for in, in the county? Uh, that you um, could well, be controlled by the county? Sure. One, one that sort of strikes me is really funny. Um, it's funny, sad, but funny, um, is when you go outside, you know, when you, when you go from the city of Spokane, either on the South Hill or on the north side, or if you're over in Spokane Valley and you go from Spokane Valley to unincorporated Spokane County, 
um, it, it seems as though our county has permitted uh, development to get ahead of its uh, sister agencies, the transit authorities' ability to service those areas with public transportation. And that's something that I think the, uh, the work group, the environmental work group, could work with the transit agency and others to sort of make sure that if we're going to permit development to occur um, perhaps too easily in unincorporated Spokane County, we need to make sure that we've got either the infrastructure there to service it or public transportation to be able to minimize the amount of uh, single car driver trips to and from those areas. Thank you, Mr. Green. I'd like to ask Mr. Cummings the same question. Uh, it's there in the chat. It's uh, I'll repeat it for, for everybody online here. Um, asking, what is your understanding of the links between land use, transportation, and climate change? And what policies do you support to help Spokane County residents reduce additional vehicle miles traveled? Sure. Uh, it, it's incredibly wasteful uh, that, that we're so sprawled out and people are forced to, to commute. You can see this every afternoon. Uh, on the freeway, if uh, the cars just are a parking lot, um, headed back to Idaho, um, Division and Aragon, all over Spokane County, um, and there's, we're not we're not just wasting time, uh, uh, we're wasting fuel and energy. So I, I'm I think this pandemic has brought to light that there's a lot of things that we can do um, remotely and and use technology, and I think that's an area that we really need to explore and. And to do that, it's gonna require that uh, we improve our, our broadband infrastructure and that, that we partner with uh, private industry as a county to explore every way that we can facilitate people to work remotely and work from home and then, and then plan our communities different. So when we have uh, big projects like the Amazon, we need to really sit down and figure out, well, where are these people gonna live and how are they gonna get to work there? Because climate change is an absolutely huge uh, problem, but so is quality of life. And, and when we are gridlocked, uh, trying to move around, that, that's wasting energy and wasting time. And I, I think that's where you know development and collaboration, working together and, and forward thinking vision, um, it's a win-win for everyone because there's gonna be job opportunities on this and it's the right thing to do to protect our, our world and our planet and our, and our people. Uh, primarily that you know the people that are hurt by this are, are the poor and people of color it, with uh, transportation costs and and uh, their ability to get to and from work in adverse weather um, there's lots of alternatives that we can do to explore to improve lives and to save energy and and to uh, reduce our carbon footprint thank you mr cummings specifically about mr green's suggestion about creating some sort of a committee or working group uh, that would focus on these issues. Is that something you would support if you were elected commissioner? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that's how we get the best outcomes when we work together and, and, and bring all the experts into the room and every group that's uh, interested in this, I wanna hear from as many viewpoints and on, on all sides. And, and really when we move forward, I wanna move forward uh, with a unified you know, thought process and goals. And uh, I think it, I think uh, discussion and commissions are the way to go. Excellent. And my third question I have, I'm gonna start with you, uh, Mr. Cummings. Although the city of Spokane and the state of Washington both have adopted science aligned goals for reducing climate pollution and are developing specific plans to achieve them, to date, Spokane County has not done either of those things. So my question, Mr. Cummings, if elected, would you support the adoption and creation of pollution targets and the creation of a climate action plan for Spokane County to achieve those targets? Uh, just off the top of my head, yes. I, I mean, I think uh, if you don't have targets, if you don't have deadlines, you really don't have a, a plan. So um, I think putting realistic goals in there and outlining targets along the way, milestones to reach as we go is absolutely critical. Um, it, it's how you gauge your progress. It, it gauges how realistic it is and if you need to reset. Um, I think the, the big thing is that we need to, to uh, continue to uh, attract the best and brightest minds that we can to Spokane County. And to do that, we're, gonna, we're going to need to uh, put out the word and, and advertise that, hey, we're serious about this. This is a, this is a goal that we're committed to. We need you. We wanna attract 
uh, like-minded people to Spokane to help work on this on this committee. And I think that's good for our community. It's gonna create jobs. It's gonna retain young people that are gonna to wanna to live here. And, and this all comes down to leadership. We need a, a county commissioner that is, is progressive in the fact that uh, they believe in science. They are, they're not beholden to uh, developers or, or energy companies. And they're going to be looking for the long-term goal and health of this community. And I think that's, that's critical. Thank you so much. Mr. Green, same question to you. Would you support the adoption of climate pollution targets and the creation of a climate action plan for Spokane County to achieve those targets? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I would encourage the county to join the County Climate Coalition, which is a group of like-minded counties that have, have, that, that have gotten together to put together um, and share information with respect to what their respective counties are doing. Um, the chair of the DNC's Council on the Environment and Co Climate Crisis is Michelle Dietrich. Michelle was a county commissioner in Washtenaw County, Michigan, um, back in oh, you know, 2017 or thereabouts. And in 2018, um, they actually created their um, environmental infrastructure work group that I spoke of in, in res with respect to the first question. And there's a template that we can use. There's, this, we're not reinventing the wheel. It's something the county should have done a long time ago. Um, we're just catching up to the city of Spokane and the state of Washington. And um, it's absolutely imperative that we take action. Um, if we're going to, if we're going to be trying to make changes, um, the longer we wait, the less incremental those changes are and the more compressed changes that we have to do in order to achieve goals within a reasonable period um, to try to be in line, aligned with the uh, Paris Accord. Excellent. Thank you both so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to share your views on climate change. This is not a topic that uh, is frequently discussed at the county level. And I, I think that voters will really benefit from understanding where uh, candidates stand on these issues as they begin casting their ballots in the next few days. Um, so that concludes our, our first segment focusing on the Spokane County Commissioners. Again, thank you, Mr. Green and Mr. Cummings so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. Feel free to, you can turn off your audio and video, wonderful. So in our second segment this evening, it will focus on races for the Washington State Legislature. If I can share my screen again. So in our area, we have a number of different legislative districts. We'll be focusing on legislative districts closest to Spokane, specifically the third legislative district, which encompasses uh, central Spokane here. We'll also be uh, looking at races in the fourth legislative district, which covers east of Spokane to the Idaho border. The sixth legislative district, which wraps around the third to the west and the south. And then finally, the seventh legislative district, which includes parts of North Spokane and stretches all the way to the Canadian border. If you're not sure, which legislative district you are in, I encourage you to go to the website listed in the chat where you can easily find your legislative district by putting in your address. After the primaries, we invited candidates running to represent each of these legislative districts, that is the third, the fourth, the sixth, and the seventh. Reg regrettably, we didn't receive responses from the candidates running in the seventh LD. Voters will have to infer from that silence what they will. However, I'm delighted that we do have with us this evening candidates running for office and the other legislative districts in our area. Because of the large number of candidates running for the state legislature in our area, we've divided this segment into two parts, with the first part focused on the third legislative district and the second part on races in the fourth and the sixth. The third LD, uh, as, as candidates, as I call your name, I would encourage you to turn on your camera and your microphone. I'd like to welcome a candidate for state Senate, Andy Billig, and candidates for state representative position one, Laura Carter and Marcus Riccelli. And finally, candidates for state representative position two, Tim Ormsby and Bob Apple. Regrettably, state Senate candidate Dave Lucas did not respond to our invitations to attend. Candidates, just a quick reminder of our format this evening. You'll have a question and have two minutes to respond. I'll uh, have up to an additional minute for further discussion at my discretion. 
our timekeeper Trenton will hold up a card, a yellow card for 20 seconds left and a red card when your time is up. And with your help, we can make sure that everybody gets equal time to share their views with the Spokane voters tonight. So first question, as the devastating fires in California have reminded us, the impact of global warming is not a problem for the future. Our quality of life today is threatened and the challenge grows larger the longer we take to address the root causes. This is, introduces my first question, which goes to Mr. Billig. Mr. Billig, do you believe that Washington State Legislature or the governor should declare a climate emergency? Why or why not? You have up to two minutes. Well, thank you, Brian, so much for uh, hosting. Thanks for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here and talking about uh, one of the most important topics that we um, will deal with as legislators. Um, you know, whether the governor declares a climate emergency or not, to me, is so much less important than the actions that we're going to take. So it's fine. If uh, I Great. I support declaring a climate emergency. But if we declare a climate emergency and don't do anything, it doesn't matter. And if we uh, actually take action without declaring a climate emergency, that's fine, too. I don't think that is the determining factor. I think the factor is that we get into session with strong uh, majorities that are going to take action on climate. That's why elections matter. And um, if we can increase the majorities that uh, of people who um, take seriously, I mean, it's crazy to me that we're still having the debate at all about climate change and whether it's man-made that's been proven over and over, and we're wasting time to take action. So we need those strong climate action majorities and uh, so that we can take action on things like the low carbon fuel standard, and protecting uh, all of our natural resources so that we've got clean air and clean water and a healthy planet for generations to come. So Senator Billig, would you say that the question is not then whether it's an emergency, but whether to declare it an emergency? Exactly, it clearly is an emergency. I'm saying that the technicality of whether you declare it or not, it is the emergency. And so we just need to take action because you could declare an emergency you know, with some technical, some resolution or something, it doesn't, that doesn't change anything. We need change, we need action. We don't need declarations, we need action. And um, so yes, it's fine if we declare one, we have one regardless of whether it is somehow formally declared or not. I assume that part of the idea would be that it would enable the governor to take actions that would be quick enough to address the scope of the problem. Is that something then that you support? I guess I would have to uh, know more about what that actually means. I don't think that there is the ability to, uh, for the governor to take unilateral action at some significant scale, like a carbon pricing scheme or something like that, based on an emergency power or an emergency declaration. I, I don't know that to exist. I've never seen that before. Um, so I, to me, what it would mean is it declares an emergency and that puts a spotlight on it. So that's a good thing but then we need the legislature to come in and actually take the action so we can do something uh, significant and stop kind of nibbling around the edges of what we've been doing. Thank you for clarifying, I appreciate it. Uh, Ms. Carter, I'd like to, to repeat the same question for you. Do you believe that Washington State Legislature or the governor should declare a climate emergency? You have about uh, two minutes if you'd like. I don't think we necessarily need to declare it an emergency, but I think there are, defi uh, there are definitely things that we need to do about forest management. There's so much dead wood that is so flammable, and yet they're not doing anything about it. We can sell wood and maybe uh, make money in tools. So, hello? Okay. Um, yep. Still hear you. Okay. Uh, um, anyway, I, I'd like to thank you. I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting some feedback. Okay, I'd like to thank you for including me in this uh, forum, even though some of my answers were not uh, in agreement to yours. I don't think that we are a major cause of global warming. In fact, I heard rumors that they, there may be global cooling, that we might uh, eventually enter a mini ice age, but that's not, um, but let's uh, talk about the forest. I think a lot of the forest fires are, um, are caused by arson. And, but uh, they, they continue because there are a lot of, um, like I said, dead wood that needs to be managed, that there needs to be a clearing of the forest uh, there needs to be harvesting of the forest so that um, so that there would be less fuel to be burned. So anyway, that's my answer. So you, uh, to clarify, you don't think climate change is an emergency and is that, is that what you're suggesting? 
Uh, actually, yeah, because uh, it, it's cyclical. I mean, what can we do about it? I mean, it, uh, uh, the, cl the sun is what controls most of our climate. The sun and other natural um, um, phenomena, like the ocean currents and so forth, um, they have more effect on our climate than what we as, man as human beings do. Uh, there's, uh, the, the solar activity has a lot of effect on our climate. So, and there's not much we can do about what the sun does. So, so some years uh, we may have more sunspots and other times there's um, no sunspots. I don't know uh, what causes what, but some years uh, there's uh, warming, other years it's cooler. And it's not necessarily global. Like on this side of the continent, uh, we could have like mild winters, whereas on the other side of the continent, they have record breaking uh, freezing temperatures. And then um, about 15 years ago, about the time I moved up here, there was this global warming conference that was going on in Copenhagen. And during that time, I think like God um, uh, sort of answered them, oh, you want global cooling? I tell you what, here, take this. So they had this record breaking freezing temperatures with, with um, a with a blizzard, with all these people protesting global warming. That was kind of ironic. Thank you for sharing your views, Ms. Carter. I'm, I'm sure that Spokane voters really appreciate understanding where you are on this issue. I'd like to turn to Mr. Riccelli, if you would be willing to address the same question, whether you believe that the state of Washington legislature or the governor should declare climate change an emergency. That's my answer. I think it's helpful. Um, and I did, um, after meeting with some uh, forward-thinking young people from my district uh, sign on as a co-sponsor to Representative Kirby's bill, uh, HB 2829, which did that. Uh, I was proud to be a co-sponsor, but I also agree with uh, Senator Billig that it's really the, the actions we take um, are, are what's important. So, you know, I'm driven by the conviction that our, our children should inherit a better world, um, that we should protect and preserve our immense natural beauty, that there are this is an existential threat. Um, I'm, I'm scared for all of us if we do not take this on as a very serious issue. And I think Washington State has, has worked hard to try and put ourselves out as leaders, but we just need to do more and we need collaboration. And it certainly doesn't move us forward to have an administration like our current one in the federal government um, who is uh, taking us out of treaties. Um, thankfully, we have governors that are working together, but. But um, this is a, a global issue and we need to treat it as such. And I look forward to um, standing by my track record of voting um, for actions and I, actually not just voting, but I think it's incumbent about, upon us um, as elected officials, but as a father, as a community member to be speaking out loudly and leading on this. Um. Thank you so much, Mr. Riccelli. Do you have specific proposals that you would then adv advocate instead of declaring an emergency? Well, certainly. I mean, we pass things like the low carbon fuel standard off the House floor. We support actions and I support actions such as incentives uh, and clean air standards to hold polluters accountable and improve the quality of our air. We need to do things like locally, like improve the, the, our Spokane River and remove toxins. Um, there's so many things that we could be working on. And I think part of the problem is one of the big things is conservation uh, and, and working how we conserve energy. I'm working uh, I've been tapped by our um, chair of our transportation committee and the House Democrats will be putting forward a proposal on a transportation revenue package. We need to look at how we are actually spending our dollars um, and potentially a revenue package that can incentivize folks um, to use multimodal transportation and mass transit. Um, I, I'm particularly interested in that because, again, I think we face uh, challenges like obesity and diabetes epidemic among our youth, et cetera. These all are moves that we can make for our health and for our climate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Apple, I'd like to turn to you if we could. I'd like to ask you the same question that the others have been addressing. Do you believe that wa the Washington State Legislature or the governor should declare a climate emergency? I think Mr. Apple, you might be on mute still. Let me see if I can help you. See, see if you can unmute. There that you should go. have taken care of it. Very I good. want to thank you very much, uh, Brian Hanning, for allowing me to participate with the others. It's important for us to get our opinions out to the voters, and you're helping, and that's great. So I thank Gonzaga, you, and your staff, or even volunteers. 
no, I don't think it's an emergency. We just went through or are going through a COVID emergency presently. And, and I think that's pretty telling about how changes can occur in emergency that aren't legislated. And mandates can get very tenuous and difficult. And I don't think we want to ever consider uh, anything like that unless we know the facts. And, and I like science because it relies on facts and evidence and proofs to back it up. And so I think we need those before we take action. I know when I was on the city council, there was a move, I voted against it to put uh, electric car chargers out and we did. And I see now that some of those are being removed. They were really never used. So it's an expense to the public we can avoid. We should only do what we have evidence to prove. And what do you think we have evidence to prove? No, I said we should only do what we have evidence to prove. So if we have got proofs and evidence to back it up, then we can take action. And yeah. that is what we need to have. And not only do we, by the example I gave. Excellent. So I was just clarifying um, what you thought we had evidence to justify doing. Uh, if you wanted to elaborate a little bit more on, on that, what you did think we, we should do then. Well, we, you know, like, I'll tell you, when I was involved, and I have been for many years, I supported the Toxic Waste Initiative, 97. It was on the ballot some many years ago now. And it helped clean up some toxic waste problems. It helped the voters tell the state you need to direct attention here. I also worked on the Growth Management Act. I know you mentioned that in the commissioner's uh, little stint. And I think it's important that we have planning and design planning in advance. And though it didn't have the voters, it did by the legislature. It is now law. It's being used, mandated, and it works. And it works best when the people are acceptive of it. And that's why we need laws that people agree with and, and are accepting, and even environmental laws. So nothing in particular about climate change then? Well, <laughs> I, I'm, I agree. The sun is the number one factor. And unless you can adjust the sun, and I don't think we can, you're not going to make that change. If we have evidence to prove that we're actually causing real problems, then we can't. But the fires that have been occurring, uh, that's bad force management, and it's been going on too long. We had a number of years before we started working with the forestry community where we, we had really bad problems, worse than today. And then we worked with them, we cleaned up the problem, and we had very few fires. But we have been shirking the negotiation responsibility with the forest industry and giving them contracts to harvest, which is the, the counterpart to that deal. And without those kind of deals in place, we're not putting the roads in, we're not clearing the brush. So fire fighting just isn't as easy as it was. And we need to get back to that point. Thank you for clarifying, Mr. Apple, I appreciate it. Uh, finally, I'd like to turn to you, Mr. Ormsby. Um, same question to you. Do you think that the state legislature or the governor should declare climate change a uh, state emergency? Oops, I think you might still be on mute. Thank you for the heads up. Is that better? Yep. Thank you. Uh, I just want to start out uh, by by thanking uh, Gonzaga uh, for the uh, for the forum on one of the most pressing uh, global uh, issues. And I, in answer to the question, I would agree with my seatmates, uh, Senator Billig and Representative Richelli, that I am interested in outcomes as opposed to uh, pro forma things. Now, if there are substantive things that the declaration of a climate emergency can change the conduct of business or provide avenues that aren't currently available, I think that's fine. I think the proof is in the pudding I've gotten a belly full of symbolic actions at the national level that are going to guarantee us access to health care or are going to guarantee lower prescription drugs that seem to be much more uh, form than substance. Uh, there's no question of that. So I believe that's incumbent on the legislature uh, to take action. And I think many of the things that have been talked about before, whether it's the greenhouse gas reduction to zero by 2050, 
whether it's 100% renewable energy by uh, 2045, uh, the low carbon fuel standards, all substantive things that take us on our way to do Washington State's part in what is a global issue. And I th don't think you have to look any further than snowpack, for example, and water flows uh, diminishing much sooner in the cycle than they had previously to know that there are impacts. And I wanna make a clear distinction between two things, and that is climate and weather. And I want to distinguish that temperature is not the thing that we should be gauging our behavior on. It is the overall, uh, the overall global climate scenario that is what should, that we should be keeping our eye on, not the temperature on a particular day. Thank you, Mr. Armsby. So to clarify, uh, again, uh, when you said you agreed with some of your seatmates, do you, you think it's a, it is an emergency, but you don't necessarily uh, have a preference as to whether to declare it symbolically as such? Yeah, and I, and I would be interested of knowing the difference between what I am interpreting based on my current knowledge as symbolic versus substantive legislative action that I am more familiar with. Thank you, Mr. Armsby. I, I appreciate that clarification. Uh, I'd like to turn to a second question and, and begin at, uh, at the other end with you, Mr. Armsby, if we can, just to go in reverse order. Um, and I'd like to return to the question regarding uh, transportation emissions, because it really is the largest source of emissions in our state, and it's one of the most difficult to address. So again, I'm going to return to the question from the first segment, uh, which is, is concerned tailpipe emissions as this number one source. And the, the question is two parts there. It's in the chat. The question is, first, what is your understanding of the links between land use, transportation, and climate change? And what specific policies would you support to help Spokane residents reduce individual vehicle miles traveled? And since that's kind of complicated there, feel free to, you can see it there uh, in the chat if you, if you need to. I do better auditorially. So there were the okay. links between uh, land use, land, climate change, and use, what was the third uh, thing, Dr. Hemming? Uh, transportation. Oh, thank you. So, you know, the old adage is true. If you build it, they will come. So to the extent that we have land use policy, that allows for urban sprawl, that allows for tracts of land to be uh, extended out beyond uh, the urban growth areas that is really necessary. It's more than, that is not necessary for us to address uh, the growing population here. So land use has definite implications. It costs the public dollars to extend pipes for water and sewer and electricity and fiber. Uh, and the, the links between uh, land use, climate change, and transportation is the amount of time that f folks spend uh, in their vehicles, single occupancy vehicles, to and from work. And the longer that they're doing that, the greater distance they have to travel, the more that they are emitting. I think that we're getting to the tipping point in terms of electric car battery technology that is going to extend, be able to extend the ability for folks to travel. I. I did some research uh, just out of curiosity. There really isn't a reliable vehicle that would get me from here to Seattle or to Olympia uh, without having to stop and charge. And I think we do need to account for the convenience factor for human behavior and folks' willingness to put up with a layover in order to be able to do uh, uh, some clean travel. But we're getting there quickly. We're light years ahead of where we used to be. Those things are linked and the tailpipe uh, business, low carbon fuel standards would go a long way to uh, addressing part of that problem. The other thing is getting, acknowledging the issue. We cannot happily ignore the fact that we are major contributors because of our vehicle policy and ignore the fact that it is a major contributor to greenhouse gases and the changing of the world's climate. Thank you, Mr. Armsby. Just a quick follow-up. When you, you talked about low carbon fuel standards, and, and I'm not sure if everybody um, online tonight is as familiar with that. Did you want to briefly say um, what you mean by that? Well, the, the uh, you know, I am not a subject matter expert on this, Dr. Hemming, and I am hesitant to, but what I do know about the policy is been identified as one of the key first initial components that we can do in public policy 
to reduce that tailpipe emission that you were referring to. As far as how the science goes and what the technical aspects of the low carbon fuel standards are, it is, it is a regulatory scheme that requires uh, that the amount of carbon that vehicles are emitting uh, is controlled and diminishes over time. That's really helpful. That's, that's plenty good. Thank you so much for, for adding that clarification. Um, so I think next on our list is Mr. Apple, uh, same question. We're talking about um, the links between land use, transportation, and uh, changes to our climate and what policies you would support, uh, if any, to help residents reduce individual vehicle miles traveled. Well, we're back. I mentioned it before the Growth Management Act and, and uh, it, it is critical. And we're using that here in Spokane and the county. It's been law now for 20 years. So it, it, it is important, but it's also important that the people know why and what's going on. So there's public involvement pro in the process. So when we when when there's there's hearings involving growth management, people get involved and they get to see not only the people who are going to live there, but the people who are making the developments, which is very critical and important. That way the cities, towns, counties can plan the residential streets, sewers, water lines to, to accommodate. So all those things coming together, it's very important. It's very nice. It's the way it should be. Uh, we run into problems with travel nowadays. Where we uh, narrow down streets, create congestion, and people run their engines sitting at a light or a stop sign needlessly. Some of that needs to be taken care of. We've been waiting for a north-south freeway in Spokane for decades. That needs to occur. It will, it will save fuel in the long run and get people and commodities where they need to go. As historically, do you think that building more roads has been successful in a, as a way of reducing vehicle miles traveled? I, I think certain roads really do help. Uh, if you can get people through major metropolitan areas without stop and go, it can really be a help, especially for truck transport materials that we put in the stores. Those need to get there one way or another. And it's important that we find ways in government to make sure that that occurs. When I was on the city council a few years back, we made sure that the streets were accessible certain hours of the day for truck travel. And it's important not to encumber the regular residential traffic. So those are other ways we can help congestion. And one other quick follow-up since we, we have time here in your, in your segment, you mentioned the Growth Management Act. Do you feel like that's doing a good job of addressing land use issues and transportation at present? It, it could be better <laughs> because one of the problems Eastern Washington has had is a, not a, a strong willingness to accept. However, as time has gone on through the last 20 years, that has really gotten a lot more easily, more easily done. So it is become more norm and it is helping both the developer and the municipal governments accommodate the infrastructure needs that are needed. Thank you so much, Mr. Apple. I appreciate you clarifying. Uh, Mr. Riccelli, I'd like to turn to you this, uh, this difficult question about the links between land use, transportation, and climate change, and what specific policies you would support to help res Spokane residents to reduce our miles traveled. Well, thanks for the question. I um, kind of got my schooling up as a city plan commissioner many years ago, so I learned a lot about land use policy and um, how that's connected. I think as a member of our transportation committee, I was helpful working with my colleagues in a bipartisan fashion to make sure that we're investing in things like uh, multimodal transportation. We invested here heavily in the central city line. Uh, we invested in a U district pedestrian bridge. We supported things like safe routes to schools. Um, we look at things like walkability. Um, I, I think these are all important. I also think one that might not be on the radar from a transportation side is a lot of other states are being more creative. So when they're going in, they're focusing on dig once policies. So along roads, they're putting those sidewalks and bike paths, but they're also putting conduit um, for broadband. Why is that important? I think we've seen through COVID more people can work uh, at home if they have the tools, but we have a, a digital divide. So I actually think broadband is an issue that could help reduce our carbon footprint too, and we should light Washington State up. Um, electric, electrification of our vehicles is important. I think state government, federal government can be leaders in, in that type of policy. But I, I want to go back to something that I think uh, Representative Ormsby said. Are where we build and, and the expectations is important too. So um, as developers look to build, um, 
you, you know, if they're not going to pay for the infrastructure, that should really be considered. I also think um, the idea that, um, uh, you know, for commercial office buildings, you know, where there's large masses of uh, people going, if they're built out there, the expectation should be the from the developer that, you know, we're going to run a bus line there. Uh, we should focus on density and make things, uh, make sure that we're growing smartly. Um, so those are some of my ideas and my thoughts. Um, I think that there's a lot of room on this. Uh, I, again, I also think we need to just support actions such as incentives um, uh, and clean air standards to hold uh, polluters accountable and improve the quality of our air. And I think that there's a number of actions that will actually come forward um, in this next legislative session. On electrification of vehicles, which, which uh, Representative Lawrence also mentioned, what specifically would you support either by incentives, infrastructure, or other things? What specifically do you think should be done to help electrification? Well, we're already looking at Washington state, but I think if uh, state government can partner, if federal government can partner, let's start with just our government fleets. Um, I think that's a huge way, that, uh, the huge tail that, that, that could wag there um, that would be important. Uh, I think that's one thing. I think there's a um, possibility for us to look at incentives um, within um, tax rebates and other things uh, as well. So I think there's a number of policies to incentivize folks around electric vehicles. We have done some of that, et cetera. But I really think government um, vehicles and fleets is a, and, and looking at things like even as our school districts, et cetera. Excellent. Thanks so much for clarifying. I'd like to turn to you, Ms. Carter. Thanks so much. Uh, would, I'd be curious to get your opinions on this question about how we use land and, and the effects that it has on transportation and climate change. Do you have thoughts on what specific policies, if any, uh, you would recommend if you are on the legislator, legislature representing us uh, for reducing vehicle miles traveled? Okay, uh, yeah, for one thing, I think what we're doing right now, doing Zoom, we don't have to travel anywhere. We can just do it in the comfort of, the, of our homes or in my case, a friend's home. When I, I was going to go to Everett, Washington to attend the uh, Republican State Convention. Well, um, it was on Zoom, so I saved about $60 in gas by doing it here instead of going over there. Now, um, a, a decade ago, somebody invented um, a car that runs on hydrogen fuel. The byproduct of that would be water. And then some, uh, gas uh, the, some oil company bought the patent and it just never came about. Now that would have been a clean uh, fuel as long as it could be built safely. Now, I, I think currently, I noticed that our buses are hybrids. It used to be that when we were behind a bus, you can uh, smell the fumes, yuck. But now um, it's uh, pretty clean. I mean, uh, you don't, uh, uh, you don't uh, smell the fumes anymore when you're behind the bus. Now, when we are, uh, now we have a problem with um, a lot of trains going by, uh, crossing highways, and everybody has to stop. Almost everybody has their engine going. I take, I turn off my engine, so it won't be, um, so it won't be um, emitting more, uh, more exhaust. So you know, I, I wish more people would do that. I've seen people in, in Walmart parking lot just sitting there with their engine going, so they can run their air conditioner. I'd rather just uh, endure the heat and have the engine off. I just don't like sitting there idling with the engine on. And I, I don't know if we can actually legislate people to turn off their engines when they're uh, parked somewhere. But I also, uh, I'm also like the idea of maybe having a solar panel on buses. Maybe that would help um, uh, cut down, that might help um, provide electricity. I don't know how feasible that would be. Thank you. You bet. Do you have any thoughts on the, the land use part of this uh, since the how we choose and where we choose to build uh, affects uh, patterns for transportation? Do you have any thoughts on, as a legislator, how you would address land use issues and its relationship to transportation? Well, I know what some of the ideas are, is, that, uh, is to have more people living in the city so they don't have to go very far to, to do things. But um, I, I'm also for property rights for the right to people to live out in a cleaner environment where it's safer for the children. It's not, uh, I don't think living in a congested city is really a, that safe of a place to live, especially for families. So, so, you, so you wouldn't be for increasing density, for example, is that, is that what you're suggesting? I, I'm not in favor of increasing densities, but if people want okay. to 
if people want to live in the cities and want to build more apartments so people can be close to work, oh, fine. That might work for people who don't have children. Thanks for clarifying. I appreciate that. Mr. Billig, um, last to you, uh, same question on this intersection of land use, transportation and climate change. Do you have specific policies that you advocate for uh, in the legislature to address this concern? Yes, definitely. Um, I think it's really important to think about those connections. I mean, one of the challenges we have um, in the legislature is that things go through committees. And I find on land use, it's difficult because land use is the local government committee, it's the transportation committee, it's the environment committee. And so we, we often um, have to sort of piece it together. And that's one of the things we're talking about right now as we plan for the next legislative session is how do we handle land use, use policy in a way that uh, brings in all the stakeholders and all the public comment and does it in sort of a collaborative way. But in terms of specific policies, um, I think it's really important um, for us to address this, this challenge that we have where over the last, I don't know, 50, 60 years, we have engineered the environmentally friendly transportation choices out of our built environment. They also happen to be the healthy choices. So we've made it harder to walk and to bike and to take the bus. And um, you know, now, you know, sometimes people get say, oh, why are you working so much on all that bike stuff? We don't need to add all that. Well, I consider it mitigation. These are things that should have been there all along, but we have, we have actually engineered it out. So things like um, Representative uh, uh, Richelli mentioned the U District Bridge. Well, that is a way to make it easier for people to do the healthy and environmental choice to get to work and to get to do uh, for recreation. Um, it also spurs economic development, as we have seen in that South Landing area. So it just is a win all over the place. So that's one thing we have done. One thing we should do locally, another thing we can do um, is to do on heavy corridors, do transit only lanes. So on division, I think the next big transportation project we should do here is to make transit only bus rapid transit on division so that the fastest way to get to North Spokane is by taking the bus. And so it's gonna be convenient, it's gonna be healthy because people walk to the bus stops and it's gonna be environmentally friendly. Those are good examples. Did you, when you say we've sort of organized our way out of, of these options, did you have specific impediments um, in addition to building that infrastructure, what, what impediments should be removed to sp specifically help uh, address those issues? Well, unfortunately with a lot of it, big things have already been built. So we have to mitigate it with, um, you know, adding sidewalks and, and reducing uh, the number of lanes so that you can add bike lanes and a nice sidewalk. And it's not just having a sidewalk. Having a sidewalk where the traffic is going by you at 50 miles an hour doesn't encourage people to walk and make it safe and healthy to walk. So you actually just, you really need to plan this stuff out. So some of it's mitigation. Some of it is when we're redoing a road to make sure that we're doing it in a way that calms traffic and makes it safe for these, for these other things. And then I just wanted to touch on density as well, which you mentioned, it's so smart. I mean, not only is it good for reducing miles traveled, uh, it also is the smart thing to do economically um, because you already have all the services there. There's already fire and police nearby and there's already water and sewer and electricity and fiber. So density is a, a, a priority for so many reasons. And, and just finally, if I could, uh, to connect back to something Mr. Apple mentioned, it, do you think that the, the part of the solution is to uh, just simply, we need to build more roads if we have too much traffic? No, I don't think so. What, what we know is when we build more lanes, just more people show up. It doesn't actually do much to, to mitigate. And, um, you know, I have supported the North Spokane Corridor because I do want to get that truck traffic off a of division so we can do things like, um, uh, you know, uh, like the, the transit, um, bus rapid transit uh, dedicated lanes on division and because it's half built and we should finish it and connect it up because there will be some benefits there. But we would never design the North Spokane Corridor today. That is not the way we should be designing our cities and our roads today. We should be looking for ways to make it um, um, healthier and more environmentally responsible. Thank you so much uh, for indulging me. All of you have been really generous with uh, your time. I know that's a very busy uh, period of, of the election cycle for you tonight. And so thanks so much for joining us and for sharing your views with the uh, Spokane voters. Uh, feel free, you can uh, take off your, your video and your microphones. Feel free uh, to, to hang out, but thanks again for, for coming uh, tonight.
I'd like to turn in uh, this part two uh, of the second segment to the fourth legislative district and the sixth legislative district. As with the others, we invited all of the candidates for the fourth, the sixth, and the seventh to join us. Uh, and uh, as I call the candidates, feel free to uh, turn on your video and unmute yourselves. Uh, for candidate for the fourth legislative district, state senator John Ross Kelly. Candidate for state representative position one, Lori Fagan. Candidate for position two, Lance Garrell. Candidate for sixth legislative district, state representative position one, and Z uh, Zach Zapone. And finally, candidate for sixth legislative district, state representative position two, Tom McGarry. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, just a quick reminder, uh, in case you weren't a, a here at the very beginning, I wanted to remind you that we have a question and you'll have up to two minutes to respond. Our timekeeper, Trenton, uh, will let you know with a yellow square when you have 20 seconds remaining and hold up a red square when you have uh, your time is up. So I'd like to start with the first question to Mr. Ross Kelly. Uh, Mr. Ross Kelly, uh, at, in the months since the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many other of our citizens, people across the country have been calling for concrete actions to make our society safe and equitable for all citizens. So Mr. Uh, Mr. Ross Kelly, do you support a just transition to a sustainable society that prioritizes helping communities and workers that are most impacted by climate change and are, and are and are disproportionately subjected to environmental pollution. You have up to two minutes to answer. Okay, let's see. I'm going to read that on your screen. Uh, that came at me a bit, a bit wild here. Where is yeah, it on? I'll read it. Yeah, if it's on chat on the chat. I'll read it again while you're reading okay. it for everybody. So do you support a just transition to a sustainable society that prioritizes helping communities and workers that are most impacted by climate change and are disproportionately subjected to environmental pollution? Well, I do. Uh, let's see, transition to sustainable So the question is asking about the intersection, basically, of, of environmental pollution and, and the way climate change society yeah. Yeah, and climate change. Well, it, the only thing I can say there is I do uh, uh, support that transition. Uh, you know, climate change is happening fast. Uh, we can't we can't stop it at this point. Um, uh, Washington State has uh, 79 uh, million um, metric tons of pollution that we're putting into this into our air. Uh, a lot of the pollution is happening in the most dense areas of the um, state in Seattle, Tacoma, Spokane. Um, these are areas, in, uh, dense urban areas that uh, where all the traffic is. Uh, so it's going to be a major problem for people who are uh, living in these, these communities, uh, whether they are people of color or whether they're uh, lower income, uh, they have, will have problems uh, uh, with these, uh, with the pollution. Um, uh, I know that uh, a lot of the rural areas uh, have a considerable amount of pollution as well. Six of the largest uh, refineries are on the west side. Uh, they're more towards rural areas, but they contribute over 60% of the pollution, uh, carbon dioxide in the state of Washington, um, not just uh, which, you know, is, is uh, uh, huge uh, on this particular um, uh, transition, but uh, climate change is going to be here. It's going to come on to us uh, very quickly. Um, I cannot believe that we have people that uh, uh, do not believe in of what's going on. Um, uh, you know, we have some of the largest corporations in, in the nation here in Washington that are uh, polluting our air, and uh, we need to get them accountable for what they're doing. Thank you, Mr. Ross Kelly. It's a, it's, a, it's a challenging question. I guess I'd give you an opportunity just to expand on if you had any policy suggestions for what it would mean for you um, to advocate for a, the, a just transition to a sustainable society. What policies might you advocate for in, in that context? Yeah, well, that is difficult. Um, I'm, I'm having been part of the legislature. I was part of our county commissioner and we did have, uh, we put in the, the first 
GMA compliant comprehensive plan, which you know, it helps with uh, transition here in Spokane County as far as um, uh, pollution and, and transportation issues. And, um, but the policies in the state, uh, I would work harder to, to, rather than chip away at some of these smaller uh, areas of pollution, uh, take on the big boys. And that means take on Exxon and uh, Phillips 66 and uh, Tesaro and some of these uh, bigger companies and uh, you know make them comply with emission control rather than uh, let them get away with uh, putting so much pollution in our, our uh, atmosphere. Thank you so much. I'd like to turn next to Ms. Fagan uh, with the same question here, whether, asking whether you support a just transition to a sustainable society and what policies you would advocate for to try and uh, achieve that. Thanks, Dr. Henning. Um, this is a, a very intersectional question. Um, climate change, um, social justice, um, the health and education and um, job disparities that we find in communities of color are all intersected and they're very historical. So um, coming back to our recent um, climate issues, especially with the fires that we've uh, witnessed this past summer, and I think it, it clarifies even more how uh, climate and social justice can be intersected. So, um, you know, I'm a nurse practitioner. I've been in healthcare for over 30 years. So I see a lot of things through that healthcare lens. And one of the things that I understand um, is most impactful when we're talking about climate change and um, our communities of color that are disproportionately affected are their access to health and their underlying health conditions that make them more susceptible to things like air pollution, water pollution, uh, food insecurity, uh, living in uh, areas in our, in our cities, both urban and rural, that um, uh, have been inundated with industry and polluters. So um, as far as policies go, um, let's make sure everybody has um, access to quality and comprehensive healthcare. Let's make sure that we invest in childhood education and higher education so that we can have better economic equality. Um, and all of those things will help people survive and, sus and um, sustain themselves as, as we fight the climate change issues. It's a very complex um, question, and I think it's going to take a lot of very complex and intersecting answers. And I'm, um, I'm looking forward to being in the legislature to help um, the experts and the stakeholders find those solutions. Thank you, Ms. Fagan. Just to clarify for, for everybody who's with us tonight, uh, when you use the, the phrase intersectional, what do you have in mind by that? I mean that all of those things are, are, have a historical basis and um, we can talk about redlining, we could talk about housing inequality and all of those things created um, inaccessibility to good jobs, inaccessibility to sustainable and affordable housing, inaccessibility to quality health care. Um, and it, it's just that intersection of disparities that has created a lot of inequities in our communities of color. Climate change is one more, um, a, you know, nail in that, that whole picture of disparities. And uh, it is, it's all interrelated, it's all interconnected. They're very complex and it's gonna take a lot of um, forward thinking uh, legislators and bringing people that are impacted to the table to lead and show us what we need to do to make things better. Thanks for that clarification, appreciate it. Mr. Gorell, uh, same question to you. We're, we're discussing whether or not you support the idea of a just transition to a more sustainable society and exactly what that would mean to you if you were uh, elected to the state legislature. There are a couple of things that come. Oh, from, there you go. There are a couple of things that come to mind immediately. Uh, one is that um, people of um, people of color, uh, minority neighborhoods, are often in uh, neighborhoods that have been polluted by the presence of industry over time. Um, oftentimes those industries pick up and leave, 
but there's no responsibility for them to clean up the pollution that they've left afterwards. Um, I think that's an example of how as we, as our society moves forward with technological changes, it's important to take into account the effects that those things have had on neighborhoods. A another thing that's important is to consider uh, workers who have been involved in, in industries and that as we transition because of climate change, it's important for us to be able to support workers through, um, through retraining programs. Um, That's helpful. Thank you, Mr. Gurel. Did you want to expand at all? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, if I, if I interrupted your flow there. No, I think that's, that's it. Excellent. Uh, I'd like to turn to, to Mr. Zappone. Uh, do you have a, a, a position on this idea? What does uh, the idea of a just transition to a sustainable society mean to you? Yeah, thanks. I think it is important to think about um, the populations that have been disproportionately effect, impacted by environmental pollution and that's um, intentional disinvestment in our cities, in our inner cities, uh, oftentimes with um, populations lo or minority groups located on next to freeways and they have higher outcomes of asthma and other health impacts. Um, neighborhoods that don't have investment in walkability, sidewalks, access to grocery stores, um, restaurants, and that makes a, a web or a neighborhood more um, walkable. And I think that those are some of the impacts that we're seeing and I think when we are talking about how do we invest in a future, a, a green economy, um, we're going to see different workers disproportionately impacted by the transition to a green uh, economy. And we need to make sure that those workers have um, the a first right to those new jobs and retraining programs to those jobs. That's the just transition there, is that we're not just taking the workers and forcing them to, to lose their jobs without... Um, competitive pay and training programs so that they're able to have a change to those jobs. Um, that's a, a big issue and we need to prioritize those current workers who uh, work in industry that is polluting and as we are transitioning away from it, making sure that they're getting the support they need uh, to be able to get those jobs of the future. Thanks so much. Appreciate your ideas there. Uh, last week we have Mr. McGarry I'm really curious to get your position on this idea of, of a just transition that we've been talking about. Uh, if you were elected to the legislature to represent your district, what, what would you advocate for? Well, first of all, I think it's important to recognize that there is a problem. The science is in, I've said throughout my campaign, science, not science fiction. Carbon dioxide is the greenhouse gas that keeps the sun's infrared rays from bouncing back into space. It stays in, 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 our, in our atmosphere and creates uh, global warming. I, people who blame sunspots and, and, and whatever else, I, I'm tired of people just being so dismissive of, of the issue. It is an existential issue. There's no question about it in my mind. Um, the science is in. Carbon dioxide is the problem. Um, now I have um, some experience with um, forest management, that sort of thing. In fact, we had a press conference this afternoon for my fire district, I'm a commissioner, where we announced a um, fuels mitigation program, um, which will, um, at least in our district, um, over the next 10 years, um, maybe not eliminate, but will substantially reduce the fuel load, thus keeping um, our wildland fires um, from becoming catastrophic as, as what we're seeing now. And I know that Commissioner Hillary Franz is, is working on this as well. I hope to work hand in glove with, with uh, Commissioner Franz on, on this particular issue. Um, I think we clearly need to um, look at tax incentives for clean, for clean vehicles. And I also um, am very concerned that this does have to be a transition. Um, I don't want people left behind. I want people to be brought forward. I, I, I think uh, Zach made a, a, a very compelling uh, case that this is, is something that's gonna have to be done over time with appropriate training. Uh, we can't just put people out of work, um, but I think there's plenty of things that we can do. Um, uh, trans, uh, tax incentives for 
uh, fuel efficient vehicles, um, maybe some research dollars for our institutions of higher learning for more efficiency, for more efficient batteries, and that sort of thing. Um, public transportation. Yes, uh, in answer to the question, I definitely support a just transition to uh, um, clean energy. Thank you so much. Uh, in our second question, uh, I'm going to do what we did last uh, part and, and go in reverse order. So I'm going to start with you again, uh, Mr. McGarry. And uh, my question concerns uh, the fourth and the sixth legislative districts, uh, which uh, in our neighborhood are um, uh, populated by people, many of whom are not persuaded that climate change is in fact uh, a, a serious issue. And you've begun to answer this question, but I was hoping as candidates for the fourth and the sixth uh, to give you an opportunity, if you were having a conversation with a neighbor and wanted, and who was not persuaded that climate change was uh, a problem, uh, didn't think it was worth spending any time discussing, uh, how might you begin to, to speak with your neighbor uh, about this issue and, and what would you say to try and persuade them uh, if indeed you, you would want to do so? Well, Dr. Having, that's a, a, a very, very difficult question because we've seen here tonight that getting people to admit that science is real and that one plus one equals two and that carbon dioxide, which is put into the atmosphere by human beings, is a major component of greenhouse gas. I think the only thing that we can do is um, support the science, cite the science. I'm certainly not a scientist. I suspect that you may be the only science. Well, no, I, I think Lori is probably a scientist as well. You may be a scientist as well, Dr. Anning, but, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, the, the fact is, um, I, I think we just need to, to hammer the issue that, um, we see a decline in forests. We see uh, as we see um, increases in, in greenhouse gases. Um, how do you make somebody listen? Um, I think maybe Senator Billing might have made the, 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 the most important point is that we need clear majorities in, in both houses of, of the legislature um, that we're going to have to take the necessary steps. We can try to explain. Um, we need to provide the information. It's, it's, it's a matter of, of listening, of course. Um, but what do you do when somebody won't listen to science and math? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I think we need to, to go forward with it respectfully and um, um, try to accommodate people and their opinions as much as we can. But um, like I said initially, this is an existential threat. And just because you don't believe in climate change doesn't mean that it's not real. You might believe that COVID-19 is a hoax or that you know, certain that, that uh, hydroxychloroquine is a cure for, for COVID doesn't make it so. And how do you tell somebody who believes those things from their heart that they're wrong? I guess you have to be respectful and um, do what you can to be as, as persuasive as possible. Thank you so much. Mr. Zappone, uh, same question to you. Uh, what would you say to friends and neighbors in your district uh, about uh, climate change? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think the vast majority of people uh, actually are reasonable and listen to facts and science. Um, there are some of those who don't and, you know, you can't win them over, but the vast majority of people are somewhere in the middle and uncertain and not, don't know all the facts and figures. And I think uh, it's about having dialogue and discussion and understanding from sides, from, from both sides. Um, but ultimately it's about finding the common ground and talking about what, what changes have you seen here in Spokane locally? Are things different than how they were? I grew up here in Spokane and we didn't have smoke season when I grew up. And that's an easy place to start uh, finding some changes or in our environment. Um, talking about this week is abnormally high temperatures and the highest that I've seen in October for a long time. Um, so is that normal? Is that how you guys remember October being? And just trying to find that common ground first, starting with a baseline of facts that people can agree upon, and then uh, looking to research and, and backing that up with that's a, as a result of climate change. Um, here's what all the scientists are saying and uh, coming to some common agreement from there. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Mr. Gorell, uh, 
Same question to you. Do you have a, an approach that you would take with your friends and neighbors uh, regarding climate change? It's a difficult problem to reframe because I think this is a matter of, do you, do you understand science? Not do you believe science because we're not, this isn't Santa Claus where we're asking whether you believe it. I think we have to reframe and, and realize that some people do not understand science and so this is a matter of education that science is real and that there are some things that are really beyond beyond question. Um, another thing is that I think that we can try to reframe to, sh to have people see the business impacts that climate change is having. Um, we've already mentioned um, uh, things like the fires, the um, um, climate change is increasing the, the pine bark beetle um, advance. Uh, there are ways that climate change is affecting our, our economy or affecting our jobs. And I think those are some of the things that will um, kind of bring it home to people that um, climate change does have to do with them. Uh, another thing that I think personally has been helpful for me is to not to kind of skip over the question of how our current climate change situation was caused and think about what can we do to mitigate it now. However, it is that climate change, and I choose to believe science, there are things that we definitely can do as communities and as state legislators to help mitigate the changes that uh, are happening and and that's where I try to begin my conversation with people about the reality of science and climate change. Thank you so much. Ms. Fagan, do you have an approach that you would recommend taking to neighbors uh, in your uh, in your district? Um, I, I like to tell stories um, when I'm having these difficult conversations. Um, you know, I'll talk about anything under the sun, really, literally, um, as long as we can start from a point of truth. But sometimes telling a story can help break the, the, that conflict. Um, first of all, climate change shouldn't be a political, it shouldn't be a partisan issue. It just is. Um, we have vast scientific consensus that climate change is real and that it is human caused. And I think um, John Ross Kelly will appreciate this. I've climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. I've been to the top, I've seen the glaciers and they're shrinking. You can't argue with that. Um, we've seen um, Australia on fire. You can't argue with that. We have, as Zach mentioned, um, seen smoke season. I've lived in Spokane area for almost 40 years. Well, it, you know, yes, fires can be caused by arson, but what makes our forests and our grasslands even more susceptible is something called drought. And then we have a, a lowering of our water um, uh, levels in, in our aquifer here at home. So you can't argue with those truths. You can't hold up a snowball and tell me that climate change isn't real because it snowed yesterday. That's not how that works. So let's stop politicizing climate and let's start talking about making sure that our futures are intact for our grandchildren and our great grandchildren and the generations to come. We're running out of time. We have to get serious about this and we have to start making changes now before it's too late. Thank you so much for sharing your views. And finally, we are turning to Mr. Ross Kelly uh, where we began. Do you have uh, an approach that you take in discussing with your neighbors uh, in your district uh, about uh, the threat of climate change? Well, I do. I would tell them climate change has always been part of the natural cycle of the earth. I learned this when I was uh, as a geologist uh, at WSU in the 1960s. There's going to be an ice age, there's going to be a warming, there's going to be an ice age, and then a warming. But it, this is all at the speed of geologic time, hundreds of thousands of years. We don't even think in those terms. Um, not when we can get a cafe latte at Starbucks in three minutes. It wasn't until mankind entered 
picture of 150,000 years ago, this natural cycle was at risk. I like the way one documentary I saw described man's entrance. Assume the earth began January 1st, midnight. Mankind entered the picture on December 31st, 15 seconds before the new year. And even though we entered so late, we have had such a huge impact on the climate. Since we've managed to accelerate global warming and climate change, beginning with the Industrial Revolution, the past 100 years have added carbon monoxide, nitrous oxide, uh, methane, all into the atmosphere. And this is creating this big blanket. And the more blankets you put on, the warmer it's going to get. So with more and more of these greenhouse gases getting stuck in the atmosphere, it's going to warm the Earth further and further. We've already warmed it. 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit in 100 years. And we're going to warm it up to 5 degrees Fahrenheit even more in the next 100 years. Now, whether we can even survive as a population, as a, as a human race, 8 degrees warmer, it's going to be hard to raise food in, in areas that are just totally uh, desert. Um, so that's what I would tell them, that they, uh, they need to consider all the aspects of, of uh, what we're contributing to the Earth's atmosphere and how it's affecting everything we do from weather to drought to uh, the oceans, rising of the oceans, the melting of the uh, Greenland ice cap and the, and the Antarctic ice. Uh, it's all contributing to a, a major problem. Thank you so much to all of you for sharing your views on climate change uh, with the voters in, in, your, in the fourth and the sixth. Uh, it's, I'm hoping, going to become increasingly common for us to annually, uh, each election cycle, have a conversation like this uh, so we can begin discussing exactly what different elected officials would or wouldn't do related to climate change. So thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to share with voters your views. Um, and you can feel free to, to turn off your video and your microphone as we uh, transition to our third and final segment. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. So in our third uh, segment, we're gonna be focusing on Congressional District 5. And uh, just again, to give you a reference to the, this, as many of you know, uh, the 5th Congressional District is uh, most of Eastern Washington. And so this is our federal representative representation in Eastern Washington. After the primaries, we invited the two candidates running for Congress, the incumbent Kathy Morris Rogers and her challenger, Dave Wilson. Unfortunately, Representative Vic Morris Rogers declined the invitation to attend tonight and to share her views with, on climate change with voters. However, we're very happy to have um, Dave Wilson with us this evening and I um, welcome him to turn on his microphone and his video. Mr. Wilson, uh, you will have uh, a question and then you'll have up to two minutes to respond to the question with an additional minute for me to facilitate discussion. Uh, Trenton, our timekeeper, as you probably noticed in the last segment, will hold up a yellow uh, square indicating that uh, you've got uh, 20 seconds left in a red square when, when your time is up. So, uh, uh, our, for your first question, Mr. Wilson, uh, I'd like to ask you if, if Joe Biden is elected president, he pledges to advance major climate legislation uh, that would seek to dramatically reduce climate pollution and focus on creating green sector jobs. So I wonder if you could talk to the uh, and, and discuss if you're elected to Congress, whether you would be likely to support that climate legislation. Uh, yes, I would. This is an issue that's of uh, great interest and importance to me. I think that uh, time's a wasting and we need to get started on it sooner than later. Um, you know, I, I can't uh, say that I'm uh, familiar with every policy position on climate change, but uh, number one, I believe it's a significant problem. It's an existential threat and uh, I plan to be um, you know, first of all, I'm open-minded to any kind of uh, policy that will help address the issue, and I, I plan to work on it and be an ally for those that are uh, driving that, those issues or those policies. Excellent. Thank you so much. And my second question, I'd like... 
Sorry, I'm getting a little bit of feedback there. Is that from me? <laughs> it's possible. Let me see. I'll continue I can on. Turn my sound down. I couldn't hear you very well. I had to turn it up. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So my second question concerns the, the disproportionate impact on low-income people and people of color. Uh, many suggest that the climate crisis is not just an environmental issue, but uh, a human rights and a social justice issue. So I'm curious what you think is the relationship between climate change and the fight for equity and justice? Hmm. Um, well, I haven't... Uh... I guess studied that issue or that angle of the issue. I know. I mean, I've certainly uh, I'm aware of it. I I just haven't uh, looked at it. I guess. Um, um, just to frame it for you, just to give you a, a, a yeah. an entrance in. What I'm wondering is maybe to ask it this way: Do you think climate change is just an environmental issue uh, that it's just for people who can are concerned about the environment and and not not other things? Well, I, I, again, I'm not sure that that gives me the framework I need. It's, um, I'm, I guess I'm just not following your question. If you could frame so, it differently. So, for example, yeah. So, uh, let me think of it this way. Sorry for the uh, for the question not being clear. So, some people would say there are some issues that are issues that. Are, are related to people who could care about people, um, homelessness, hunger, uh, disease. And so people who care about people are worried about issues like that. And then there are people who are worried about whales and about the environment. Um, so I'm wondering uh, if this is in fact a, would you agree with this way of classifying climate change? Is climate change just an environmental issue? Or do you think it's, it's, uh, if it's bigger than that? And if so, in what way? Well, it's, I think it's much bigger than that. As I said a few minutes ago, I, to me, it's an existential threat. And it's because it's not immediate, because it, for too many people, it seems like it's too far in the future. Uh, I think that's one of the challenges that we face. And, um, but I, I look at it, you know, so I look at the federal government's job is to keep us safe. That's, that's their number one job. And so if you look at big threats or existential threats, uh, let's just think about this for a minute. So let's start with uh, nuclear war. You know, for many years, that was the existential threat that everybody was concerned about. I think if you look back over 70 years, 75 years, I think the United States did a pretty good job of keeping us safe and preventing nuclear war um, because just about everybody was focused on it. Both parties were in agreement that it was un unacceptable and the world felt the same way. So mission accomplished for now, of course, that's, that's an ongoing threat. You can never, you know, think it's behind us, but I think we've managed that well. Now, what are some other existential threats? Well, right now we're in a pandemic. Uh, we didn't plan well enough for that. We had an office of, uh, you know, pandemic prevention, and that was shut down two years ago. Um, and we're not, you know, we haven't responded well to the virus now that it's upon us. Uh, I think that, you know, people are going to learn. I would like to think that people are going to learn, policymakers are going to learn that you have to have a, a prevention plan. And then uh, if if that doesn't work, then you have to have a plan to deal with the issue. Well, I see climate change is the same thing. It's it's an existential threat. It's much bigger than just an environmental issue. Um, it's important. We need to get, you know, we're not ahead of the curve. In my mind, we're behind the curve. So we need to get caught up on it and then stay caught up on it and keep it in the forefront of people's minds. This is, you know, this is something that's, uh, we're already in dangerous territory. Thanks so much. Um, so as you know, your district uh, includes many small rural communities, uh, Colfax and Pullman and, and Chewila and Colville, and many other, other uh, small communities in Eastern Washington. And I'm, so I'm curious, and this is sort of a, a version of the question I asked in the last segment. Um, when you're in other parts of, of the fifth 
district, uh, how would you go about talking to uh, citizens in those areas about climate change? Uh, do you have an approach that you would you you would take? Well, I've been, you know, in uh, the age of COVID, we're not doing uh, any travel. We have our in-person events, but I've been doing virtual uh, town halls and meetings with different groups in, within the district. Um, of course, most of the people I'm talking to, uh, not by my choice, um, are Democrats who are wanting to come out and meet me. I and, and I love talking to Democrats, but I'd like to also talk to you know, people who have different views. Um, you know, I think that my impression is even Republicans, so I gave a talk, this is probably a better example. I gave a talk at a Rotary Club uh, a couple of weeks ago, and um, I'm pretty sure most of the people in the room are Republicans, but um, I didn't hear a lot of denial. Now these, you know, these were probably um, what I would consider, um, Republicans and they were probably more moderate or mainstream Republicans, and I didn't get a, we didn't I didn't get the sense that there was a lot of denial or pushback when it came to climate change. In fact, a couple of them spoke up and expressed their concern uh, very strongly, and uh, but it was pretty obvious they were uh, more conservative. So I don't I haven't run into the deniers. Um, at least in this campaign, because probably because it's a virtual format and um, you don't, you know, it hasn't been the subject matter for for these town halls. I did do a, a meeting with the Citizens Climate Lobby in uh, the Palouse. They've got a pretty big chapter down there. That was interesting. I learned a lot. Um, but again, those were all true believers in the problem. So I don't know if I answered your question, but uh, I tried. I, I appreciate that. I, I'd like to return to a question that we've been asking tonight, um, and I, I pasted it in, in the chat if it helps to be able to also read it, but it's related to this question of land use, transportation, and climate change. A lot of uh, this problem seems to be related to where we choose to build. Uh, how we choose to build and and the effects that that has on on transportation since that's the, our, the largest source of emissions in our state so i'm just curious if you were elected to represent us in the federal uh, Re house of representatives what you would advocate for to address uh this this part of the problem related to land use and transportation well i think that first of all we have to have really strong fuel standards uh, like they were set at the end of the Obama administration. I know they've been rolled back. I think we need to continue on that path. Um, one of the things that um, that appealed to me about the Citizens Climate Lobby, uh, their bill is the, you know, the carbon dividend bill. I think there are a lot of um, strong points to that policy. I know that not every environmental group subscribes to it, but I like it because I think it uh, is market driven. It, um, I think it reaches, according to their, the literature that they shared with me, it reaches the same goals or very close to the same goals as any other of the programs. But I think that it gives it puts incentives in the right place. Uh, it's a good system of uh, incentives and disincentives. And I think that anytime you can um, give people incentives that shapes their behaviors, um, I, I think that's a good thing. And so I think um, I'm drawn to their plan. I think that it's a good plan and it's got uh, some bipartisan support. It's, it's got support of industry. Uh, it's it's supported by, you know, they have an impressive list of endorsers. So um, those are probably the, you know, I think that addresses the, uh, they, their plan addresses the transportation and land use issues that you're asking about. 
As a, as a final question, I'd like to ask one that we haven't uh, touched on tonight. It's one that we did ask last year and was submitted originally by uh, the youth activists who are part of the what's called Sunrise Movement here in Spokane, Sunrise Spokane. This is a youth-led climate action movement. And the question that they submitted last year was, was related to uh, something uh, like the, the, the following. Uh, as a young person, uh, who's going to inherit uh, the, these I these problems and this issue, uh, why should we consider voting for you? So if you were to speak to young people who uh, may be tuning in tonight, what would you say to them? Well, that's an easy one, uh, Dr. Henning, because my opponent doesn't believe in climate change. It's just that simple, she does not. Uh, I do. Uh, I may not have all the answers, but I believe in it, I'm gonna work towards fixing it, and uh, I think it's a very important issue. So to, as I said earlier, it's, it'll be one of my top issues. Um, the Congresswoman um, has extremely low ratings from uh, several different organizations that uh, focus on this subject. You know, quite frankly, I don't get it. When, when I look at climate change, um, you know, you're, I'm sure you're familiar with the precautionary principle, and uh, which is the principle that really, you know, you're, you're betting, you're protecting against your downside. What's your downside? What's the worst thing that can happen? And um, to me, this is an issue that even if, even if you're on the other side and you're not sure that climate change is real, how can you take the chance that it's not. It's, it's like having a home without uh, homeowners insurance or fire insurance. Uh, that's why we have it. It's not that we want to use it. It's, you know, we, we want to have it for peace of mind. So to me, what I don't understand um, is th this would be the conservative thing to do. Because when, when you're truly conservative, you're trying to protect against your downside. And if these people who are against climate or don't believe in climate change, or maybe they're, uh, maybe it's not that they don't believe, but maybe they are on the fence. To me, this should be a conservative issue. They should be concerned about it if they're not certain, because there's a lot of science out there that, you know, proves that it is an issue. So I don't know why it's not a conservative issue. Uh, it should be. And I think that, you know, that's one of the approaches that I'll take to try to bring voters around to my way of thinking. But as far as young voters, this is a huge issue for them uh, because they are going to be stuck with it and uh, we're not doing enough to address it. So I will work on it. My opponent won't. Thank you so much, Mr. Green, for being with us tonight and for showing up. Uh, I know that you're very busy as all the candidates are. and We appreciate you giving us an opportunity to learn more about your views regarding uh, climate change. Can I point something um, out, Brian? You certainly may. You uh, you called me Mr. Green, which I appreciate. I I w I'll take that nickname, but my name is Wilson. I'm sorry. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you were thinking of David Green. I'm David Wilson, but uh, if you want, you're call right. Me I Green, from you, that's a compliment. <laughs> Oh, goodness. I almost made it all the way through, Mr. Wilson, and <laughs> here I am at the end. <laughs> Thank you so for much for so gently pointing out <laughs> this, oh, you're welcome. that mistake. Up the good work. Thank, you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. I appreciate you being here. You bet. So uh, you, you feel free to you can take your video and your, your mic off there. Uh, I'd like to just conclude by reminding you all of uh, the fact that uh, the ballots are coming out. And I'm so going to put on the screen here. Um, tomorrow, I understand that the ballots will start going out. You should have them within the next few days. Uh, it is still possible to register to vote if you have not done so already. Uh, it's our hope that no matter uh, how you vote, that this nonpartisan climate forum has helped you to understand where candidates stand on climate action and how that will inform uh, your decision uh, in this November and October. By way of conclusion, I'd like to read a, the, a brief portion of Pope Francis's speech from his 2015 visit to America from the White House lawn. He said the following, 
It seems clear to me that climate change is a problem which can no longer be left to a future generation. When it comes to the care of our common home, we are living at a critical moment of history. He continues, we still have time to make the changes needed to bring about a sustainable and integral development where we know things can change. Such change demands on our part a serious and responsible recognition, not only of the kind of world we may be leaving to our children, but also to the millions of people living under a system which has overlooked them. Our common home has been part of this group of the excluded, which cries out to heaven, and which today powerfully strikes our homes, our cities, and our societies. He concludes by saying, to use a telling phrase of the Reverend Martin Luther King, we can say that we have defaulted on a promissory note, and now is the time to honor it. I would like to thank the wonderful staff at Gonzaga's Instructional Development and Design uh, for allowing us to use their studio and providing technical assistance. As a reminder, a recording of tonight's event will be available on our website tomorrow. In the chat, you can find it, www.gonzaga.edu slash ENBS events. It'll also go out to all of you who are registered for this event. Thank you all for coming tonight, and don't forget to consider the climate when you vote. <laughs>